There are some pretty impressive, impressive buildings in this world. Have you been to an impressive building? Have you ever been to like the Sears Tower? Have you ever been to uh, the Empire State Building? How about the U.S. Bank Building in L.A.? I actually went up in that and I did this slide where you go on the outside of the, uh, yeah, if you're afraid of heights, don't do that because you might die. Um, it's kind of scary because you, you slide over the inner, the inner city uh, of Los Angeles in this plexiglass like slide and you go to this deck. It's kind of crazy. It's pretty cool. But that's one impressive building that I've been to. But the most impressive building in the world is in this place called Dubai. Okay, it's called the Burj Khalif. Okay, it's the biggest building in the entire world. It actually stands at 2,722 feet tall. And that, in stories, in, in however many um, floors it is, it's 167 stories up. And I want you to imagine you are tasked to build this building. Okay, what, what are you thinking? First of all, you're probably like, wow, uh, <laughs> I. That, that's, that's a lot. I don't know if I, if I can pull that off. This building actually took six years from start to finish. Once the foundations were laid until um, the, the, the ribbon was cut for the opening ceremony, six whole years. It actually took 22 million man hours total to build. Also, some interesting things is it, you know, I want to know how much concrete was put into this. Here's how much concrete. Here's how much it weighed. 242 million 508,488 pounds of concrete. That's how much it took to build this building. I want you to imagine, I told you, you need to build a replica of this, but it needs to be full size, and we're going to put it right here in Camp Pondo. It's going to be like as tall as the mountain. It'll be really crazy. We're going to put it right here on the field, and all I'm going to give you is this uh, pile of Legos. Um, uh huh. What would you say to me about that? You'd be like, John, that's the game you had us play yesterday. Um, it's not fair that you're making us do that twice. We can't build that big of a building out of those Legos. I thought the Ark of the Covenant was enough. Um, and it was. I'm going to keep that. It was very good. That was, that was awesome. But you wouldn't be happy if you were tasked to build such a big building without the tools to build it, without the materials to build it. And it's the same thing with the church. It's the same thing with the church. We are tasked to be a part of this building process. But, but the good thing about that is we have someone behind us. Jesus Christ is building his church and we're working together with him. And we have his resources at our disposal. So although the, the building of the church might seem like too big of a task for anyone to complete, well, Jesus is on our side and he's given us the means to complete it. I want to remind us where we've been this weekend. First of all, uh, on Friday night, we talked about uh, Matthew 16, 18. We said that Jesus is building his church, and this is the plans he has for the church, the, the blueprints, so to speak. And last night, we talked about the budget, how much it cost God to build this church, how much it specifically cost Jesus Christ. It cost him his own life. That's how much it cost to build this church. But today, I want to talk about the building of the church. What are we actually going to do about the building of the church. And in order to check this out, I want to open up in our Bibles to Ephesians chapter 4. So open on up to Ephesians chapter 4. I'm going to look at a couple verses here that talk about the building of the church and what that looks like. Because you and I both need to see the building of the church as our job. You need to see it as your job if you're a Christian. And maybe some of you, you've been a Christian for only like 12 hours and you're just brand new to all this. What is your job as a Christian? Well, the primary job right here is as a builder of the church. Check it out. Ephesians chapter 4, verse 11. Ephesians 4, 11. It says, And he gave the apostles and prophets and the evangelists and the shepherds and teachers to equip the saints for the work of of the ministry for the building up of the body of Christ. So it says he gave a bunch of people. This is God gave a bunch of these different kinds of people to help us build the church. And it says specifically in verse 12 to equip the saints for ministry. And usually when you think about ministry, you think about, oh yeah, if you want to do ministry, that means you're maybe a ministry leader or one of your leaders. They are here doing ministry or I'm here doing ministry. That might be what you think about. But what the Bible says about ministry is it's something that all of us 
are supposed to do. It's something that we're all going to take part in as Christians. That's why it says to equip the saints. Actually, the job of your small group leaders here this weekend and my job this weekend is actually to equip you to do the ministry. That's that role. My role is to equip you to do the work of the ministry, but it's your job to do the work of the ministry. He goes on, says, for the building up of the body, verse 13, until we all attain to the unity of the faith and of the knowledge of the Son of God, to mature manhood, to the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ, so that we'll no longer be children tossed to and fro by the waves and carried about by every wind of doctrine, by human cunning, by craftiness and deceitful schemes, right? And you're saying we don't want to be people who just believe everything we hear. We want to be grounded and solid in the truth. We want to be established in God's truth. And that's what I want for you all. That's why church exists. That's why we come together so that you can be established in the truth, so you can know the truth, so you can do the truth, and so you can preach that truth to your friends. goes on, verse 15. Instead of all that stuff, instead of being carried about by every wind of doctrine, it says, rather, speaking the truth in love, we are to grow up in every way into him who is the head, into Christ, from whom the whole body joined and held together by every joint with which it is equipped, when each part is working properly, makes the body grow, so it builds itself up in love. On the first night, We talked about with the blueprints of the church. We talked about how the church is kind of like a building. It's kind of like a building that has a cornerstone and has foundations, and we're trying to build it. Last night, we we said that the church is like a bride, and these are all analogies from Scripture. So we talked about how the church is the building on Friday night, how the church is the bride on Saturday night, and this morning we want to talk about how the church is a body. Building, bride, body. Budget, or blueprints, budget, building. Okay? That's what we're talking about. The church here, we're talking about how the church comes together as a body. And I said that church building was your job. And there was a place in scripture that Jesus specifically commanded it to you and to me. He said it like this in Matthew 28, 19. Go therefore and make disciples of all the nations. That means the United States of America. That means California. That means Southern uh, Orange County. That means La Paz Intermediate School. That means DJAMS. That means RSM Intermediate. That means all these different places God calls us to make disciples. Okay, And what is a disciple? That word gets tossed around, but you can define it as this. Someone who follows Jesus Christ. That's a disciple. Somebody who follows Jesus Christ. That's more than just somebody who comes to camp or someone who goes to church. That's not all that we're talking about. It's about someone who's a part of the church, a part of the body of Christ, not just in a church building, but actually a part of the body of Christ. Last night, we talked about how anybody can be a part of the body of Christ. It's through repentance and faith. So real Christians are a part of the body, real disciples. That word can be used interchangeably there with Christians. It says, go therefore, make disciples of all the nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit teaching them to observe all that I have commanded you. So it's not enough to just teach them what's going on, teach them the truth about the Bible. He says teaching them to observe. You know what that means? It says teaching them to do all that he said. So it's not enough for you to hear God's word. That's what James 1 says. It's not enough for you to just be a hearer of the word, but we're called to be doers of the word. That's what a disciple is. A disciple is a doer of God's word. A disciple is someone who follows Christ. And it's our role now, if you are in Christ, to build up the body, which means you need to be building up other people and yourself. And it says this, this is that last verse, Matthew 18, 20. Jesus said this, and behold, I am with you always to the end of the age. You know what that means? That means Jesus is with us now. And Jesus wants to build his church. And he wants to use you today and the rest of the week and however long you have to live to build his church. But the question is, are you going to do it? Are you going to be a part of this building process? Or are you going to stand by and watch other people build it? Jesus gives us some instructions there. He says he's going to be with us always. But I want to look back at at verse 11 of Ephesians 4. So look down at verse 11. Check out what it says. This might be a little confusing, but let's check it out. We'll try to untangle it. It says, and he gave the apostles... And prophets, okay, first of all, that's two groups of people we've already mentioned. In Ephesians 2.20, we said that they're like the foundation of the church. They were used at the beginning of the church to share the gospel. And not only that, do you know who wrote this book right here? There's two groups of people that wrote this book. 
humanly speaking, the prophets and the apostles. So what this is saying is God gave you and I the Bible. That's what he gave us. How does he give us power to build this church? What is he going to give us? What are the tools to build the church? Well, the first tool to build the church is God's word. My question is, do you know God's word? Right? You might have it in your lap. You might have it on your phone. You might have it on your computer or whatever. But do you know God's word? Are you really equipped with God's word like a, like a toolbox, right? Imagine I got one of those cool fanny packs, right? I got the boots, but I don't have everything, right? I got the cool fanny pack thing. It's not a fanny pack, but it has all the tools, like a tool belt, right? One of those guys, right? Are you equipped or do you just have an empty tool belt? Right? If you say you're a Christian, if you say you're in Christ, you're called to be building the church. Are you equipped? Do you have the right tools. Point number one, gear up with your Bible. If you want to be a part of this building process, you need to gear up with your Bible. It is really a big job. It's a bigger job than building the Burj Khalif. It's a bigger job. It takes more than six years. It's been taking the last about 2,000 years, but Jesus isn't done yet. He's got more souls that he wants to save. It's important to talk about the Bible. What, what is the Bible? Okay, It says it's from the apostles and the prophets. And although we don't have any more apostles and prophets living today, we have their words in, in Scripture. That's what he gave us. He gave us his words that we can study. But what is the Bible ultimately? Well, 2 Timothy 3.16 says all Scripture is God breathe. That literally means like God, it's God's very words. When you read the Bible, you're not just reading human words. Sure, God used human authors, but ultimately he inspired them. He breathed his words to them and they are writing his words. All scripture is God breathed and useful for a couple things, right? We said it's like a tool. You need to gear up with it. Here's what it's useful for, for teaching, for rebuking, for correcting and training in righteousness so that the man of God, and that's you, if you're a Christian, you are one of God's workers, maybe thoroughly equipped for every good work. That's that same word, equipped. God wants you as a Christian, if you are a Christian here this morning, to be equipped to do this work of the ministry. Think about that, those four categories right there. Teaching, reproof, re rebuke right there, correcting and training. It teaches us the truth so we know what the truth is, so we can share the truth, so that we can help guide other people in the truth. Ephesians is going to tell us how to do that more later. But the word of God is powerful. Check this out. Hebrews 4.12, you guys know this verse. It says, for the word of God is living and active. So when we talk about God's word, we're not just talking about a book that sits on your shelf. Hopefully it's not a book that just sits on your shelf closed all week. Hopefully it's a book that you have open. Hopefully you are reading God's word because guess what? It says it is living and active. It's like it's like a person personified right here. It says it's sharper than any two-edged sword. And you know this because it says it, it pierces to the division of soul and spirit. And maybe you've experienced that. If you're a Christian, I, I almost guarantee that you have experienced that right there. You know that God's word hits you straight to the heart, and it's, for some reason, it's just powerful. And that reason is because it's God's words, because God uses it to convict our hearts, uses us, uses it to convict and tell us what the truth is. It says it pierces us to the vision of soul and spirit. Uh, we, we read a verse back on that first night, Acts 2.37 and Peter was preaching the gospel to this group of people right after he had betrayed him and betrayed Jesus. And now he's preaching the gospel and they hear the gospel and it says they were cut to the heart. That's what God's word does. It cuts us to the heart, just like a sword. It's like a sword that pierces us. It cuts us to the heart. And here's the thing. It cuts other people to the heart too. If we know that, if we know that truth, we can wield that sword and use it for God to say, this is what the truth is. You need to repent. I mean, think about that message we heard last night. Think about the cost of redemption. People need to hear that message, don't they? People need to hear that Jesus came to live and die for their sin, and the word of God pierces our hearts and shows us that. Not only that, Psalm 19, verse 7 says, the law of the Lord is perfect, reviving the soul. God's word has no errors. It's completely perfect. It's completely from God and it's completely perfect. Every word it can be believed. And we know that in part because it says it revives our soul. And if you're here at Revival and you've been saved last night or yesterday or this morning, you know that revival power. God's word gives us that power. Not only that, the testimony of the Lord, we're talking about the same thing. The Bible says it is sure. It can be believed. It's perfect. And we can know for sure 
that it is true. It says it makes wise the simple. Everybody starts out simple, okay? Simple isn't the same as foolish, okay? The Bible doesn't call, you know, little kids foolish all the time, but it calls them simple for sure. And you might think, well, I don't know that much uh, about God. I feel like I'm not, I feel like I don't know enough to like tell someone about God because what if they ask a question uh, th- that I don't know? Uh, what if they have some huge question or have some big argument against God's word and I feel like I'm not equipped enough? Well, God's word, if you're in it and you're reading it, it's going to make you wise. It's going to make wise the simple. It's also a, a tool for evangelism, one that Jesus used in Luke 24. This just happened after his resurrection. He was uh, walking on this road with some people and they were all disappointed because Jesus showed up and he died and they were like, oh man, well I guess, guess that's it for us. I guess the, the, the hope of a kingdom of Israel and the Messiah, I guess that's all passed and Jesus is talking to them and they don't even re- realize that it's Jesus and Jesus is like, what, what are you talking about? And it says he took them uh, beginning in Moses, and that means the books uh, of Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, and Deuteronomy. So beginning with Moses' writing, those five books, and all the prophets, that's the Old Testament. That's what was written at that point. It says he interpreted to them in all the scriptures the things concerning himself, which, what a conversation that would be. I mean, you got to believe he's turned into the Psalms. He's, he's turned into Isaiah 53, and he's showing these people, hey, don't you see? This talks about Jesus. This, talk, this talks about me. This talks about the suffering servant. This shows that, yeah, the Messiah, even though he's going to be the king, he also had to suffer. He also had to die. Everything that was in the Bible, Jesus is showing to these people, saying, don't, don't you believe this here? It's right here. The truth is right here. You can't do that unless you know God's word. You don't need to know God's word perfectly to share the gospel. Don't hear me saying that. Don't hear me saying you can't share the gospel. You can't invite people to the church until you're just like an expert. And, and you got like all your wanna books memorized from back in the day, right? That's not what I'm saying. You don't have to be an expert on the Bible to share the gospel. But you certainly better be equipped. You shouldn't go in there without a sword. You also, you know, if we were going to do a little night duel, right? You know what I'm talking about? You ever been to medieval times? Yeah. That's weird stuff, and the food's weird, but it's kind of cool, I guess, if you're a nerd. Um, but, but they show up, right, with those javelins, right? And they're riding, and I don't even, they, they always break. Maybe they're, maybe they're supposed to do that, because they'd kill each other if they didn't, because um, it's a show. It's not real. Um, sorry, it's, sorry, just to break it to you, Medieval Times is all a show, okay? Um, but they show up, right? Imagine you're in one of those duels, and you got some little, some little rinky-dink pocket knife, Right? And this big knight with all his armor shows up, and he's got this long sword that's like six feet long. How are you feeling about yourself at this point? Not pretty good. Not very good. Right? You need to be equipped with the sword of the Spirit. Ephesians 6 says that the, the, the Spirit, the sword of the Spirit, that is the Word of God. Be equipped with that. If you want to be part of this church building process, that's what you need to be about. But what's the point in all that? How, how do we really build the church? You need to go out and bring people into the church. That's point number two. Go out and bring people into the church. That's more than just bringing them into the church building, although that's a good start. If you've never done that, if you've never brought a friend to church, that's a good place for you to start. And if you haven't noticed, that that's why we try to do fun stuff for you guys. What we're trying to do and just like this book says, like Ephesians 4, 12 says, we are trying to equip the saints for the work of the ministry. That's why we do up all night. That's why we do knots. You know we're doing knots um, pretty soon on April 6th. Yes, during spring break. Yes, we're doing knots. You know why? Because we want to get your friends in the door. We want to get them doing something with our church so that they want to come back and that they want to maybe even come on the weekends and hear God's word preached. That's why we do up all night. That's why we do revival. That's, I mean, basically all of our events are usually focused towards that end. We're trying to help you. We're trying to make it easy, right? It might be hard for you initially to say, oh, let's go to a church service if someone's never been, but it's not that hard to say, hey, do you, want, do you want to stay up all night and go to um, Glow Zone and Ice Palace and Downtown Disney and stuff? We're trying to make, well, that one's kind of crazy. But um, we're trying to make it easy for you to bring people into the church. See, I'm just trying to help you guys, obviously. I'm trying to equip you guys to do the work of the ministry. But it is more than just bringing people into the church building. That's a good start. 
but into the church. What am I talking about ultimately? Into the body of Christ, into God's family. And how can you do that? Well, Romans 10, verse 14 says, how are they to hear without someone preaching? How are they to know? How are they to be saved? How can your friends and your neighbors and the people on your sports teams, how can they be saved from God's wrath and be a part of this church family? How can that happen if someone doesn't tell them? How can that happen if someone doesn't preach to them? And, and I know that you got a little pulpit right there, and I'm not trying to say that you have to stand behind a pulpit to preach the gospel. You don't have to stand behind a pulpit. You can be talking to your, your baseball teammate in the dugout. You could be talking to your soccer teammate while you're doing drills. You could be talking to a friend in, in your theater class while you're doing theater stuff. And, um, you know, whatever you guys do. And, yeah, ner- nerds, if you're a nerd here, that's cool, dude. Talk about bringing people to church when you're, when you're playing Fortnite. That, that's just, we, that, that can happen. There's some event, there's a sword of the spirit, right? You'd be like, you know what? I got a better sword. You know, God's word is a sword. You know what I'm talking about? Aaron like that. Thank you. I've never played Fortnite. I'm just learning. I'm just learning. I'm a noob. Okay, I get it. Only nerds play Fortnite. I don't even get it. I don't get it. It's okay. If you play Fortnite, dude, you, you've got, a, you got an easy way in. You got the sword thing and Minecraft has swords, right? Or hammers. I don't know. Is there a sword? Diamond swords. Thanks, Jackson. Here's the point. You can find inroads to get this conversation going. You need to use whatever ways you can to start that conversation because that conversation is important. There's no more important conversation that you can have with somebody than talking about their soul. The thing is, how how are they going to know if no one preaches to them? I want you to think about your friends. I want you to think about the people on your sports teams, your neighbors, all those people that you know in your life and that you can reach with the gospel. How are they going to escape God's wrath? How can they go to heaven unless you tell them? You know, you might be the only person in their life that can tell them. You are their only human hope to hear the gospel. You got, you got to view it that way. You got to see it that you got people in your classes, in your science class, in your math class. They sit next to you. They talk to you. You eat lunch with them. That they will not know the gospel. And they cannot be saved unless they know the gospel. How's that going to happen unless you preach them? It's our job as the church leaders, church ministry leaders, to equip you to do that ministry. We want to help you out, obviously. If you bring them on the weekend, I'll, I'll preach. You don't have to preach, okay? If you bring them to church, I, I'll preach for you, but you better do some follow-up for that. that. That's low bar. Getting them in the building is good, but, but even beyond that, talking to them about the gospel. You need to know the gospel. Here's what it goes on to say, that next verse. It's how are they to preach unless they are sent, and you are being sent right now if you're a Christian. I am sending you. The God, the God of the universe wants you to be preaching the gospel. As, as, as it is written, how beautiful are the feet of those who preach good news. You know, your feet are gross. Especially right now, man. If everyone took their shoes off, you better not take your shoes off. That is not an invitation to take your shoes off. Don't do it, Ryan. I, I know you want to. <laughs> feet are gross. I get it. They are. Mine are perfect, but, you know, um, they're a perfect ten and a half. You know what I'm talking about? Yeah, whatever. God says something that's even kind of gross, something that's not very dignified, even that God sees as beautiful. When you are going out and preaching the good news, God is pleased when you preach the good news. We talked about how God sent his son, Jesus, to die on the cross. How would you not want to please him. I mean, that should be your goal in life as a Christian, to please God, please your heavenly Father. He's pleased when we preach the good news. You might think feet are gross, but God says that they are beautiful if they're used to go preach the good news. Not only that, not only should you be preaching the good news and going out and bringing people into the church, but also you should be praying for this. This is something that you need to be praying for. When Jesus was about to send 72 evangelists out, there's, there's 82 people at this camp, so I guess that's not perfect, but Jesus sent out these evangelists, and they were going to go. They were people who, who were his followers. He went out to share the, he was sending them out to share the gospel, and he said this to them. The harvest is 
plentiful, but the laborers are few. Therefore, pray earnestly to the Lord of the harvest to send out laborers into his harvest. Something that you should be praying for, not only pray for the souls, that's important, but what Jesus told them to pray for was more people to share the gospel, okay? If you're a Christian, that should be on the top of your prayer list. God, please send out more laborers to preach the gospel. That's what I'm praying, and I'm praying that you become one of those laborers. And if you're a Christian, that is your job and your duty. There's no way around that. That's what we're called to do. We need more workers. Ephesians goes on. I want to check it out. Back in the text, look at Ephesians 4. Look at verse 12 again. It says, to equip the saints for the work of the ministry, for the building up of the body of Christ. We're talking about more than just bringing a bunch of people into the church. Even more than seeing people saved. That's a great start. But what he's saying here in the rest of this passage is going to talk about, in the rest of our time here this morning, we're talking about how people in the church, we need to be growing up to be like Christ. You need to grow up to be like Christ. Point number three, grow up to be like Christ. He goes on, he says, until we attain the unity of the faith and the knowledge of the Son of God to mature manhood. God wants all of us to grow up. He wants all of us to grow up to be like him to be mature in him. It's fine to be a baby Christian when you're a baby Christian. But if you've been a Christian for any amount of time, God is calling you to grow. In Hebrews 5, the the author of Hebrews even got a little upset at this group of people. He says, you guys should be teachers by now, but you're still like on the elementary principles. You still are trying to learn the basics again. We don't want to be people that God looks at and says, man, you guys should be teaching other people by now. But, but all you're doing is, is trying to learn the basics. Let's move past the basics and, and let's grow up to be like Christ. That's verse 13. Okay, how are we going to grow up? To the unity of the faith and to the knowledge of the Son of God, to mature manhood, to the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ. So what are we talking about? We need to be like Christ himself. And that's why God's word is so helpful. How can you know how Christ acted? How can you know how Christ responded to situations? How can you know what he taught? Well, it's all right here. It's all right here for you to learn. That's why that is so important. Goes on, he says in verse 14, so that we may no longer be children tossed to and fro by the waves and carried about by every wind of doctrine. So he doesn't want you to be someone who believes everything you hear about the Bible. And I know that sounds strange, but let me explain. You cannot and should not believe everything you hear about the Bible. Even people who stand up and use this book and talk from it, sometimes people use this book and they twist the scriptures. The Bible's full of examples of of people who twist the scriptures. It is always condemned and God always hates that. But what he calls you to do is he calls you to know better. He calls you to read his word. And if you're in God's word, you know the truth. You know the difference between the truth and the lie. There's a lot of people that are going to come and try to trick you They're going to try to use God's word to say, well, you know, God's not really going to get mad at sin. Because look, doesn't the Bible say that God is love? That's the one I hear all the time. Doesn't the Bible say God is love? How could God send people to hell? How how could that be the true? Well, if that's true, then you know what? Forget all this evangelism thing. Forget all this sharing the good news thing. That's not even a big deal. If really God's not full of wrath and if God's really not going to punish people for their sin, really what we're doing in building this church is kind of useless right? Well, God is love. And later in that chapter, it says God is love in that he loved us first by sending his son to die for us. Yes, God is love. And that's just one argument that people will use to twist scripture. But, but don't let people twist scripture. Know the truth. Know the difference between that and the truth. He said he, he loved us first. He sent his son to show his love. How much does God love us? We talked about that last night. That's an amazing kind of love that God loves us. God certainly is love. But he's not to be defined in any way that people come up with. It says by human cunning and deceitful schemes. And how do we counteract that? What are we going to do? How can we respond to that? Well, it says instead of being carried around by all these different opinions about God, you and I need to speak the truth in love. You know, the best way that you're going to grow. And you might think, wow, I'm a brand new Christian. How do I grow up to be like Christ? How do I do that? 
Well, surround yourself by people who are speaking the truth and love to you. And you better start this week by speaking the truth and love to other people. But when people are sinning, right? That's what 2 Timothy 3, 16 and 17 says. The word of God is useful for even rebuking people, even teaching, even instructing and guiding. It is useful for that. And if you know God's word, you can speak that truth into people's lives. But how does it say we got to do that? Well, in love. You can't just speak the truth harshly. That's not right. First Peter says we got to speak the truth with gentleness and respect. When we share the gospel with people, we can't be people who are just really mean about it and say, well, you know, you're going to go to hell and, and that's fine because God says, it. no, you got to speak the truth in love. Give the hope of the gospel for all people. We can't be people who are mean about it. But how are you going to grow up? How should you grow up. Well, the first category that he gives right here, how can you grow up to be like Christ, is you need to grow up to be like Christ in knowledge. In knowledge. It's true. We all need to learn more. We can't ever get to a point. Nobody's at that point. I'm not at that point. Pastor Mike isn't at that point.